I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every week, photographers from all over the country meet here on Zoom to connect, inspire, and create with the help of a guest that shares their images, stories of inspiration, and some tips to help you improve your photography portfolio. The schedule for our upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com. If you're new to the program, check out my YouTube channel for our previous sessions. Tonight's guest is Lawrence Lederman. Lawrence is an outdoor, travel, and adventure photographer who is a full-time overlander. Overlanding allows Lawrence to travel to remote locations and experience some of the most beautiful places in this country. Last summer, Lawrence was here to introduce us to overlanding photography, which is session number 64 on the YouTube channel. And in tonight's presentation, overlanding photography, part two, the journey. Lawrence will share what it's like living outdoors as a photographer and he'll share some of his adventures and even some of his misadventures from the past year. Please visit Lawrence's website at overlandingphotography.com and his Instagram page at overlandingphotography. Welcome back to the Happiness Hour, Lawrence. Thank you for having me, Linda. <laughs> Yay! I'm, I'm super happy to have you back. Um, so... Do you, uh, well, first of all, we just kind of joked, but you're in a building. And so yeah. I did say you're an overlander full time, but maybe not so much in the winter. What's that about? So generally I come home and see my family and friends around Thanksgiving. So okay. usually I get back, uh, I take a break for like two months or so, okay. um, generally December, January. And it depends on what I'm up to, how long it takes me to get back out on the road. This year, I have some projects going on, so I'm a little held up, but I'll be leaving next month. So when you, are you driving back to New York each time? Or are you leaving your vehicle somewhere and flying? Uh, this year, I left my vehicle in Colorado and flew to New York for like a couple of days and then I leave it in airport parking lots. Uh, right now, the vehicle is here with me because of the, how long I'm here for, but. Uh, generally, I, I, if I, if it's a short period, I have to go for, I leave it in the airport and yep. Okay. Well, uh, if you're ready, totally. is there anything that you want to say before we get started? Um, no, I just want to say thank you to all everybody here. Uh, thank you for joining. And I look forward to sharing some of my stories and, and inspiring you guys and broadening your horizons. Cause I'm, I'm going to be talking about something else other than just overlanding. I'll be focusing on something else photography wise, but uh, we have a video to play.
Wow, wow, wow. Okay, so I can say wow, but I also have watched this video about seven times. So um, each time I see something different and each time I'm just kind of um, overwhelmed by um, the spectacular scenery that we have in this country. I was telling a friend of mine earlier today, you know, if you could join in, jump in, because Lawrence is going to show us um, some landscapes and uh, pockets of nature that you and I will never see because, you know, standing on some of those rocks and clip mountains, boulders, whatever you want to call them, there's no way, no way that I would ever be able to do that. So thank you for taking us on, on a little ride with you. All right, guys. Cool. So hi, uh, my name is Lawrence Liederman and um, I spend most of my time out on the road in that Jeep that you see here in this picture covered in salt uh took me like two hours to get this salt off the the jeep but um that's my that's my home most of the year uh here's my contact info it's my email my website my instagram and uh, there's two websites there actually one of them is more of my art and one's more about my overlanding adventures and workshops uh generally i teach uh, workshops during the year but this year i haven't put out my schedule yet because I'm working on um, getting my prints into some galleries and a couple other projects at the moment, but I'll be releasing that at the end of April. Uh, so my passport to freedom and creation, um, my camera gear, it's so important to me. It really just does everything for me. I get to create, inspire, share the passion. Um, I mean, when, when I found photography, I really just kind of found myself. I became confident. I became just so alive and everything just started to make sense in my life. Um, before that, I was designing watches, which didn't make much sense. But that Jeep on the right is uh, the vehicle that I keep talking about. And that in combination with the camera gear, it just makes things work so well. I get to go to the coolest places. And, and because I have a, a vehicle that I can live in, I can constantly keep moving forward. And, uh, but before I get into that, let me tell you what overlanding is because we keep throwing out this, throwing this term around, right? And uh, you guys are probably wondering, like, what is overlanding? So um, there's many ways to define it, but I just keep it simple. And I see it as a self-reliant adventure travel to remote destinations, destinations by off-highway capable vehicles where the principal form of lodging is camping. So the two key words here are camping and off-highway capable, right? Um, so any car can really go off highway and I mean, depends on how far you want to go with that, right? Like sand rocks, there's different levels of that, but car camping is even a form of overlanding. Just as long as you have everything you need, you're safe, you have extra food, water. I mean, you're not putting yourself in dangerous situations, right? Uh, vehicle wise, uh, RV, a, a camper, a truck with a camper. Uh, some people have uh, turtle backs, which trail behind Jeeps, but there's a lot of different ways of doing it. I chose this one. Um, and then if you see over here, this is my Jeep when I first got it on the left and it's like a whole different beast now on the right. That's my dog on the left there. We traveled together my first year out with this Jeep back in 2018. Um, these are all the modifications I did to it on the left. Just stuff that really just allows me to live in it. I'll just, the, the important ones were like the fridge, the tent, a dual battery system so I could charge my gear. Um, yeah, a bunch of other safety gear. Uh, why do I love the fact that I choose this way to do what I do? It's because I have a lot of gear. I love to have my gear with me. And here's a list of all of my stuff. So... The fact that I have my Jeep allows me to, you know, be as creative as I want. I don't have to limit myself to lenses, drones, tripods, tripod heads, whatever it is. I have everything and it's always insured. So I'm not worried about if something happens. Um, and obviously my memory is not something that can be recovered. So I have my own way of dealing with memory. Every uh, couple of weeks, I ship a hard drive with my most recent data somewhere. I double back up on the road and then I triple back up and that triple backup is shipped in case something happens to me. 
because I don't want to lose my photos. But so this is uh this is this map shows you where I went this year. I left New York in April and I actually went straight to Texas. I think I got from New York to Texas in less than two days, actually. Maybe, yeah. I don't even know if I slept. No, I, mean, I, I slept for a little bit, but I got to Texas so quick. Um, and then I, I met up with my friend Justin who did something for my Jeep. But then I, I went to the Panhandle and I went to a place by Palo, Ver Palo Duro Canyon, I believe it's called. And it was pretty interesting. Um, the colors were spectacular over there, like the super red soil, red rocks, very lush greenery, very blue skies, very saturated, actually. Like the scenery there just felt naturally saturated. Um, but after I left the panhandle of Texas, I went into Colorado and Utah, which is generally where I spend most of my time. Almost every year I spend months in Colorado and Utah because just the landscapes there are so interesting. Um, they're so wild. And being on the border, close to the border, I'm usually in the southwest region of Colorado. Uh, if I get bored of the mountains, I drive a couple hours, I'm in the desert. So it's really cool to just kind of be able to flip-flop between mountains and desert, between high elevation, low elevation, just if I want, you know? Like, oh, okay, tomorrow I'm going to go to the desert. Tomorrow I'm going to go to the mountains. Uh, so that's pretty cool. But this year, I went and explored an area I've never been in, which was the Pacific Northwest, uh, Oregon and Washington. It's a whole different beast. I've never dealt with ty that type of rainforest or that type of dense forest or that type of fog or humidity every day. So that, that was fun. Um, so these are a few images of just like kind of collages of the... I put these together just to show you like the, in one image, the different colors and variation of the areas that I go to. So like you see how there's very, very yellow, very green. Um, I like that about photography and I like that about traveling. I like to just keep moving around and switching my color palettes even. Um, this is more Utah terrain. Everything here is pretty weird. <laughs> pretty alien actually uh let's see what what else uh and then here again you see like i'm in snow in the middle another whole white color palette you know and um yeah so what is it like to live outdoors that's me waking up or maybe still sleeping i'm not sure um sometimes i sleep on really cool edges of I get this is Lake Powell right next to me. And I, I woke up this, this image of me waking up is actually right over here. So I slept over there. And what's cool is, you know, I shot, I shot the night sky there. I shot blue hour, golden hour, the night before the morning after. So I really get to be intimate with a location. I really get to know it well. And I really love that. So it might take me time to capture a scene. I might not get it that first night, you know, I might have to really figure it out if I don't get there early enough, but being there for a long period of time allows me to do that. <laughs> Sometimes I'm woken up by weird animals that are making noises around me. Those deer in the top right were just like fighting over some female, I guess, when I was trying to sleep. Um, but yeah, so what, what I didn't give you was a little bit of a background to, uh, me so showing you these animals kind of just reminded me of how weird it was for me when I first started doing this I'm from New York right I'm not I never was used to being in a forest or anything like that I was in the concrete jungle so um, when I first started this the, the littlest noise would freak me out or just like the first time I was in the dark by myself I didn't know what to do and the stars were out and I'll never forget that moment but I used to go on little trips and build myself up to where I am now but now I can have sounds everywhere and if they won't even bother me, I can just hear animals and just be at peace with that. Um, so <laughs> I know th these two images are weird, but th these are from rodents that have moved into my car. They snuck in. That avocado was eaten by some mouse and that little bag of dried fruit was broken into by that same mouse. It's happened to me three times. And uh, they lived in my Jeep for about three days before moving on 
to some new location. <laughs> um, sometimes I'm in the cold, I sleep in the snow. I have multiple sleeping bags. I get used to it, but when it gets too cold, I, I gotta, I usually head home once it really hits like December cold where I can't really go anywhere. The mountains are full of snow. It gets dangerous. Um, I could go more South. I could go to Mexico. I could, you know, keep moving, but it's a good time to see the family. Um, sometimes I meet up with my friends. This night was like 30 degrees. I remember it was freezing. We had the fire pit out. Um, I like butane fires now because they're let, they're safer and the smoke doesn't come in your face. So it's easier to get warm. You're not battling the smoke. So as cool as these are, like regular firewood, I use butane more now. But this is one of my favorite locations in Utah. Um, you can see me set up there. Wind is usually like 40 miles per hour. So I usually have sand in my food <laughs> when I'm cooking. Um, I love to shoot at night. So sometimes, you know, I'll set up camp and just shoot star trails or shoot regular Milky Way shots. Sleeping on the beach, just showing you the different kind of locations I can get to. You know, uh, I have an air compressor in my car so I can air my tires up. Uh, but when I go into locations like this, I deflate them. Highway tire pressure, you know, could be generally between 30 and 40 uh, pounds of pressure. While when you go on the sand, you want to be something around like 15. So you're going down a lot. So your tires get that better traction. Um, just another cool place that I drive through, you know. These are the kind of backcountry roads that exist in our beautiful country. Um, I just wanted to stick this in there. <laughs> this is a, a fun house. This is actually, um, where is this? This is, called, this is called the Stone House. It's by Page, Arizona. So if you guys are ever like by Antelope Canyon or something, this is right off the highway. But it's a good place to do astrophotography or practice if you guys ever want to practice because there's a hotel right next door called the Cliff Dwellers Lodge. And it's so in the middle of nowhere and so cute. But this is only 100 meters away from that lodge in the dark. So if you guys ever just want to go practice astrophotography, this would be like the best place to just get a hotel room in walking distance of something really cool. Um, yeah, this is what I, uh, when I don't work out of my Jeep, sometimes I take over coffee shops <laughs> completely, kick everyone out. No, um, but this is all my gear. <laughs> um, I did take over that day. I have drones. I have to charge all my stuff and back things up. So a lot of peanut butter jelly sandwiches, a big part of my diet. Um, that was a big part of my diet. I kind of weaned myself off. I went to PBJAA, Anonymous, <laughs> PBJA. <laughs> I had to um, join PBA Anonymous to get off of it, but no. Uh, but I, I cook healthier food now. I cook pasta, turkey, I make salads. This is the back of my Jeep. Uh, this is a setup of when I'm just hanging out sometimes. You can see my laptop over there. Um, here's breakfast. Breakfast is served. <laughs> Sometimes I get to cook over really beautiful overlooks. This is actually my friend Gordon cooking. I don't want to take credit for this. All right. So moving on. That was a little bit about overlanding and a little bit of what I do in my lifestyle. But now I'm going to share some photos to you, but I'm going to mix in something that I focused on this year. Because I want you guys to like learn something and I kind of want to inspire you guys to do something new with uh, your camera gear that you already have and i'll tell you what that is in just a moment but one thing i love about photography is it never gets boring if you notice like this i put this collage together just so you can see i'm in so many different environments doing so many different types of photography there's star trails there's milky way there's long exposures there's a sunset there's a night sky there's daytime there's a sunrise there's a cityscape there's a mountainscape there's a desertscape anyway so there's so many different types of photography, right? And I chose landscape. And th these are just some of the different types of photography, right? But then just, just when you choose landscape, you have all these different types of locations, seascapes, dunes, forests, volcanoes, rivers, canyons, 
You have different types of photography. And I know I didn't name even close to all of the stuff here, right? You have macro, pano, abstract, astro, moon, sun, underwater. Then there's all the different times of day, all the different seasons, all the different weather conditions, all the different types of creative measures you can take, right? So the reason I'm showing you guys all this is because I like to pick something new every year to focus on. And that's how, that's what I do in my own time when I'm not teaching, when I'm out on the road, I pick something to really focus on. And like, I remember last year, I really focused on the moon and the shadows that it created and the different degrees of elevation and the, the, what, how it rose and set and just getting really good at shooting the moon. But this year I chose panoramic photography. So I wanna share a little bit about panoramic photography. And through that, you'll see some of the images I captured this year. Uh, so what is a panoramic image? Um, some would say it ha it's like a ratio of three to one or longer, but I, I, it's, it, can be wide, it can be vertical or horizontal. I wanna start by saying that. Most of the stuff I will be showing you is gonna be in landscape orientation. But um, you can have portrait vertical orientation for a pano as well. But this is what a two to one ratio looks like. Uh, definitely a pano to me. This is what a two and a half to one looks like or a five or a two to five. I kind of like this. Uh, I, li I like this look right here more than two. This is a three to one. So as you can see, they just get longer and longer, right? This is like three squares. And then this is a four to one, right? So because I've been shooting in panoramic format this whole year, my eye kind of has been trained to see like this now. So when I see compositions, when I go out into a vista, I, I see wide, I, I, I see this, my eyes have kind of retrained themselves. Here's another four to one view, but I, I love what I can capture by doing this. I love the, I love the big, massive story that these tell. Um, yeah, like that 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 top shot was you know, that top shot was I think like maybe ten images across, but you know you can zoom in and see all the little details. And I'll get to why I shoot panels in a second, but here are the different aspect ratios, just so you can kind of get an idea of the different types of panels you can shoot. But it's very important to keep a balance, right? To, to make sure you still have enough sky, to, to make sure you have enough foreground, not too much foreground, too little sky, but that takes a lot of practice. When I first started doing this, I would get way too little sky or way too little bit of foreground. And after a while and practicing, I, I was able to really figure out how to balance that. And I, I hope you guys learn from what I am showing you here, some of that, and maybe you guys can learn faster than I did. <laughs> um, so the gear, right? And Lawrence, um, before you go on, before you go on, there's a question yeah. right here. What, um, Darlene's curious. What is your favorite pano ratio? You might have answered this by the time you read it, but um, I don't think you did. Do you have a favorite pano ratio? Um, I like two and a half to one um, as the shortest for the long edge i like where i like beginning at that ratio and three to one is nice too um four to one gets a little bit too wide but three to one is more of how we naturally see and it plays into the rule of thirds and kind of everything we do has thirds in it even like when i compose i try to keep at least a third of the sky in my frame so I'd probably say three to one, actually, to answer that question. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you the gear I use, but don't get overwhelmed, okay? Because I'm going to I, I I'm going to show you like the overkill level and way I do it, and then like all you really need, right? Um, so obviously a camera and a tripod. That's not on here. Uh, you can shoot handheld, but I recommend a tripod. Uh, first piece I want to talk about is the L bracket. An L bracket goes on your camera just like an L, you know. Um, the reason why I like an L bracket uh, is that you can really quickly 
switch from pan uh, portrait mode to panoramic mode. So you can really quickly flip your camera. And this doesn't have to do with just what I'm talking about here in panoramic photography. I think having an L bracket in general is awesome for whatever you do. Uh, it also protects your camera from getting hit. And I don't know, that thing has probably saved my camera so many times from like fully breaking, uh, you know. So uh, on the on the top left, that's a leveling base. And that's the first thing I put on my tripod after before I put the head on. And that allows me to level the legs no matter how off they are. And then obviously a tripod head on the bottom left that number two and one that pans on the bottom. So with those two tools, with that leveling base and that tripod head on the left, number one and number two, that's all you really need. If you level that base, that tripod head will always spin level. Now on the top right, that's a multi-row pan head. It's for nailing multi-row pans, but also you don't even need it for that. The nodal slide, which you see in the bottom right corner, that's a tool that allows you to shift your camera a little bit back. Because if you think about it, guys, if you put your camera on your tripod head and you rotate it, you're rotating your camera over the sensor. You're, you're moving your camera around the actual body. But when you put it on the nodal slide, you can shift that center backwards or forwards. So depending on what lens you use, you can center the actual point of the lens that captures the scene over the tripod. So when you're shifting and moving around, it's centered. That's called uh, your nodal point. Um, anyway, you don't need it. Uh, but you know, you can take the sky's the limit in photography, as you know, you can make things as complicated as you want. So that on the left here in this image, you see that completely overkill, totally unnecessary setup, but it works really well and things become very precise. And on the right there, that's all I really need. All I need is that level and that tripod head with those two. I can nail every panel I ever want. Um, by getting your camera on the tripod head and looking at the electronic level, that's all you need. As long as the electronic level in your camera is level and you have that ball, you have the level ball that you see on the right level, you will always be able to spin your camera on that base and stay level, that's it. I know I keep saying the word level, but it's one of the most important things in panoramic photography. So a couple of sh uh, tips for shooting. Everything needs to be in manual because you can't have anything change as you shoot from right to left or left to right, right? Or up to down. So your focus needs to be manual, your color balance, shutter speed, ISO, aperture, everything. Uh, I tend to overlap about 30 to 50%. The more you overlap, the better it is. Um, well, I don't want to say the better it is because then you can have way too many images you don't need, but 30% gives you a good amount of overlap. Um, and I'll show you in a later example why. Clearly plan your shot before you start. Know where it's going to begin. Know where it's, where it's going to end. Uh, make sure your exposure works throughout. So like, don't just make sure the exposure works in the left side of it. If like the sun's on the right, then you'll just have to really make sure. Uh, and obviously you can bracket, you know, shoot in an HDR format if the, if the dynamic range is too high. Uh, I also recommend taking an extra shot on the left and on the right. Um, by the way, guys, I know you're all thinking and probably saying to yourselves, I can take one image and just crop the top and bottom that it's a panoramic image. And yes, it is. Uh, I'll touch on that later. But right now I'm specifically talking about multiple images to create a panel. So let me just continue with that, with that being said. Um, so take an extra shot on the left and right side or wherever, just to make sure you have that extra shot. 
Uh, another thing, when you're composing with your camera, when you're shooting a regular photo, you know, you can see what you're going to get if you're not shooting multiple photos. So I always recommend taking your iPhone out or whatever phone you have that does panoramas because they all, they all do and just kind of doing a test shot with your phone to see what it looks like. And um, yeah, so you can actually see how much sky or foreground you have and you get to see uh, what your shot looks like. Next, um, pan across. Yeah, I like to use a timer and a wireless trigger. So I never use my finger on the camera ever just to minimize camera shake. And that's it. Those are my shooting tips for panoramic photography. Maybe I'll name some more as I go through this. Uh, some common challenges are light changing over time. Um, so, you know, when clouds move and uh, the shadows move along the ground, that's one of the challenges. Uh, not enough overlap is one. If you, uh, if you miss focus on one shot, you can ruin the whole pano. So these are the challenges, but you get used to them and you figure it out. But also when it comes to movement, shooting oceans is very tough or anything with waves. Processing the images, right? Um, it is not as daunting as it looks. Lightroom has made it simple. There are a lot of programs that allow you to blend this with the click of a button, right? So uh, that image above there, I shot in Colorado. And um, before I continue, I just want to tell you that the reason I shoot panos is because of the extra detail I get and because of the size of the image that I get as a result, right? So aside from the look, I get a very high megapixel image and it's extremely highly detailed. So that is the major difference between shooting panoramic images with multiple shots, okay? Guys, that's very important to remember. And you're gonna see that throughout. Now, I'm gonna show you different focal lengths and I'm gonna show you different types of panoramic images so you can see what you're getting into. Um, so this is shot at 70 millimeters. As you can see, there's really beautiful compression. Those mountains are like 20 miles away from me. Those trees are like one, but they look very close. So I love having a really long focal length, but that was shot with five images, which you can see all of them at the bottom. Now you take them and you bring them into Lightroom. All you have to do is right click after you select everything and a menu is gonna pop down. Now, when that menu pops down, you're gonna have an option for photo merge. And when you highlight photo merge, uh, another menu is gonna slide out on the right. It's gonna say HDR panorama or HDR panorama. Now, depending which one of those you shot, that's the one you're gonna to wanna to choose. In this case, this is just a regular panorama. So I'm gonna click on that. And then Lightroom doo -doo 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 -doo, does its computation. And that's what it gives you back. It gives you uh, three different projections three different choices, spherical, cylindrical, and perspective. Cylindrical sort of pulls the top and the bottom a bit. And uh, perspective, um, I can't really explain what that does. It doesn't really work ever. It kind of like warps it in weird ways. Um, yeah, so perspective, you try them all out, but they don't, that one kind of never does it for me. Uh, so boundary warp will warp the edges. It'll pull whatever extra, stuff that you missed. Um, but if you hit auto crop, it'll just crop it straight. So once you hit merge, it'll do its thing. It won't return a fully edited image like this, <laughs> but it will return to you this image like you see there. This was a, obviously a lot of work. <laughs> um, but as you see here, the result is 210 megapixels, right? My, my camera is not a 210 megapixel camera. I don't think there's such a thing out there, right? I don't think there's any camera. The highest, I guess, is the phase one, which is 150 megapixels, which is like $50,000 just for the actual like sensor, just for the back. But so I realized that I can get these very high megapixel images without having to shell out $50,000. <laughs> this was the solution. So I started doing that. And, you know, this image I can print. 
I mean, I don't know exactly, but I could probably print it 10 foot long and it'll be highly detailed, right? So, I mean, the sky's the limit with these. Uh, look at the details, guys, you know, crazy. Um, so I'm going to be showing you multiple images now throughout, and I'm going to show you the different types of images. So this was a very high dynamic range situation, right? Sunrise and sunset usually are very, very bright areas, very, very dark areas. So I shot this the same way I shot the last one, except this one is in bracketing. Um, bracketing is shooting multiple exposures and then having it get blended together to create one um, and capturing all of the range of light in that scene. So here you can see this is actually six shots, but it comes out to 18 images. But again, don't let this scare you. It's the same thing as before. You highlight them all, you right click, you hit HDR panorama, bing, bang, boom. You got that. <laughs> so if you shot your panorama very well, if you had it level, if you did a great job with the right tools, you're going to have very little white edging like you see here. This is one that was shot well. So I'll just hit auto crop. It'll get rid of the top and the bottom. And I'll hit merge. Bam. That's what it gives me. 203 megapixels. And I can crop just the middle, right? I can, I can, if I don't want to use the whole right side or the whole left side, I can use just the center and I'll still have a very high megapixel image. Um, let me take this to another level, okay, guys? You can shoot multiple row panoramas too. Now, this was shot, this last image I just showed you, this one was shot with a 50 millimeter focal length and it was one row. Now, this next image right here is 48 images and it's two rows and I chose a longer focal length. When you choose a longer focal length, if you wanna get the same amount of scene in the image, you're gonna to have to take more photos. So because now I'm using 85 millimeters instead of 50 millimeters, I had to shoot two rows and the same rules apply. It's a 30% overlap. So just, I just don't want you guys to get overwhelmed by what you're seeing here, right? It's just two rows of images, 30% overlap and right clicking on all of them, doing the same thing, having it merge. This is the result. But look now. Now it's 477 megapixels, which is crazy, right? Um, they get hard to work on if you shoot like this because the higher the megapixel, the higher the strain is on all of your hardware. The computer has to work harder. So if you start shooting like this, you have to get better memory, better gear, better computers. So I tend to not shoot in a way that my megapixel count goes way too high like this. But you ready for this, guys? That's what it looks like if I zoom in. I mean, you literally, I can zoom in more, but this is 100%. If that's 100%, think about that. Look when I zoom out. Oh, this is not 100%. This was 50%. I just didn't want to zoom in at 100 so you can actually see the whole scene. But that's the kind of details I get. Okay, um, now I'm just gonna go and run through more examples of panoramas so you can see different focal lengths and how it looks. But before I even do that, I wanna go back to what I said earlier about one image and cropping. So this is a crop from one image into a three to one ratio. Granted, it looks the same as it could probably look if I used, instead of whatever focal length, this, this was, um, well, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the focal length right now, but I could have shot this in a panoramic format with multiple images, right? The result I got here by cropping down was 30 megapixels. My sensor is 61. If I would have shot this vertically and taken six or seven shots, I would have had a resulting 
200 megapixel image, right? I would have been able to zoom in and see every tree leaf. With this image, everything's going to be a blur if I zoom in. And when I say blur, it'll still, you'll, it'll look nice, but you won't be able to see every little detail, every little branch. And that's the main reason, right? Okay, now I'm going to go into the different focal lengths and what panoramic images look like when you use them. So this is very, very wide. This is at 14 millimeter. When you use a very, very wide lens, there's distortion. So when you're using something like that, you have to take a lot more images than normal because your computer won't be able to blend it. So if I shoot a scene like this, I might take 10 to 14 images and my overlap might be huge. Um, it might be, I might be overlap. I might be just moving like 10% each time instead of 30 or 50. But here you can see what that looks like. Okay, next, now we're at 24 millimeters. So if you see the mountains in the distance, they're still tiny. The foreground's powerful. When you're using a very wide focal length, the power is more in the foreground than in the distance. Um, as you can clearly see here. So now I'm at 35 millimeters. I like 35 millimeters as like um, a base. This is kind of like one of my favorite wide focal lengths for panoramas. 35 millimeters, and then I like to go up to like 70. Between 35 and 70 are kind of my favorite focal lengths for what I've been doing. Granted, you could do telephoto panels too, right? You can go in the 200 millimeters and shoot the, the top of a mountain. But anyway, so this is a 35 millimeter pano. And what I did here was pretty interesting. It was the first time I ever did this. I took my tripod and I walked out into the ocean. So I uh, clearly you can't go do this if it's too deep, <laughs> but this, the water only came up to my waist. So I walked out about maybe 30, 40, 50 feet. I don't know how many it was actually. And I, I set up the camera in 30, 40, 50. And then I set up the camera pointing inland and I took what was uh, six shots. And this was the result. But as you can see, like everything is powerful. Like the water is powerful. The trees are powerful. The clouds are powerful, right? 35 millimeters kind of gave a balance to the image. Uh, this is the image I showed you last time. This is 70. Um, now, this is a 100 millimeter image of an airport in, airport in Telluride, Colorado. So there's a plane, if you notice, in the right side. The reason I put this into this presentation is because I wanted to show you when you have something like that, you have to think about how to shoot that, right? Like, okay, I want to capture this plane in my pano, and I still want to have a pano, and it's a moving object, so what am I going to do? Well, where do you want it? Okay, I want it in the top right corner. All right, so let's start there. Let's make sure you nail that plane in your composition before you begin the rest of the panel. So what I did is I put my camera in burst mode. I kept it in that corner, waited for the plane. It took off, brrr, burst mode, got it. Then as soon as it was out of my frame, I went back into single frame exposures and then I finished the rest of the shots. So that's how I was able to nail that moving object. And you can do that with anything. You can do that with a boat, with a car. Um, you just have to think ahead. And if you notice, there's a beginning and an end here, right? You see the runway curves on the left, and then there's the plane on the right. So just keep that in mind. There's a kind of a beginning and an end to all of my images, and they give it balance. Um, and this was definitely not the case when I first started. I was screwing up every pano I shot. But this is a two row pano at 100 millimeters. And this is um, the result is 387 megapixels. And again, you can see the, how compressed the foreground is, how compressed the midground is, and how, compared the, how compressed the background is. I love a 100 millimeter lens, actually. And now we're going to zoom in even more. This is 135 millimeter. Check out that compression. New Jersey looks like it's in Manhattan. Um, I'm in New Jersey right now and in this shot shooting from Jersey, that's where the clock tower is on my left. And then 
as you can see, it's the same size as the buildings in the distance. I just love that. I love the compression I get from this kind of image. And this image is so much fun, so much going on. Um, but yeah, that's what that's what a 135 millimeter panel would look like. Um, and then I, I know I said I don't love you know super wide angle shots, but sometimes you have to do that. This scene was so enormous. Uh, just like this was one of the biggest vistas I ever stood in front of that I ever captured. And um, I had to use a 16 millimeter lens. This is 10 shots vertically. Um, I shot the foreground two hours before the night. So I, I set up my camera in one location, knowing what my plan was. My whole plan was to shoot this panoramic night shot and capture the foreground during the blue hour and capture the sky when it was totally pitch black and then blend them later um, using Photoshop. What happened here, oh, I'm sorry? Yeah, let me, let me um, ask a quick question Michael's got. Um, he's curious if you have to do any focus stacking on these telephoto panos. Um, no, because the subjects were pretty far away from me. Um, and in this instance, the mountains, like I, I went back to this image specifically, but it all, it depends on where you focus, right? Um, I focused here a little bit past the runway. So when, generally when you focus, I mean, even when everything looks in focus, in fact, it's not. There's really only one plane of focus and everything else just looks good enough, right? So in this image, everything other than what's perfectly sharp looks good enough, right? In this particular image, everything again looks good enough. Um, I did not need to focus stack. You can if you, you can, but it just hasn't been necessary in these particular images. Um, I have shot focus stack panoramic images that are not in this presentation and um, it works. You can still, you can still make it work. Uh, the same way that like the same way that I shot this foreground and then I shot the sky separately, you could still do the same thing with that for sure. Thank you. Um, any other questions before I go? Um, there's one. Um, it, it, it's kind of a general question. Karen was wondering how long do you spend um, how long would you spend to shoot your series of images for one pano? That's a good question. So the faster, the better, right? Mm -hmm. um, because things change, light changes, shadows move, right? right. And the, I, I've had so many times where I'll start a panel. By the time I get anywhere, something changed, it's, oh, it's screwed up, where I have to go back to the beginning. I, I've had to so many times start here and just keep keep going left. and. I mean, the goal, like this particular image, I didn't, the one that's on the screen right now, I did not think I was going to put together. I thought no way, because when I first started shooting the images on the bottom left, I was shooting 30 second exposures. By the time I got to the bottom right, I was shooting one minute, 30 second exposures. This, what, this image took me the longest of any panel I've ever shot to shoot. It's, I'm glad you asked on this image. Um, but that bottom right there took about five minutes, which is crazy. Usually my panels are done in 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever it might be. Um, the thing is, when you're, shit, when you're moving, this is important, guys. When you're moving your image from one to the next, you have to give your camera enough time to stop shaking. So like when I go from one image to another, I count one and then I press my trigger, which is one, two. So between shots, there's about three seconds. Um, yeah, you know, and when you have a telephoto lens on, 
when you have like a 200 millimeter lens on or something even longer, which is really heavy, sometimes these lenses take four or five seconds to really calm down. So all these factors come into play. And then what if you now want to do a pano where you're doing, where you have a ND filter on, where you're turning water into like ice, where you're totally smoothing it out, where you're doing 30 second photos, you know, three shots are going to take you 30 seconds. So it really depends on how creative you want to get. The goal is no matter what, to get it done as fast as possible, but still have the level of quality and precision there. That would be my answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so, all right, cool. So now I'm gonna show you three images that are the same place at different focal lengths, right? Uh, this is 14 millimeters. I want you guys to focus on the right side. So that mountain in the distance <clears throat> and uh, those buttes that are right before that mountain. So this is uh, 10, 10 shots vertically, 14 millimeter. Notice what's powerful here. Just kind of like these rocks in the foreground. That's about it. Like my eye doesn't go really anywhere else. They, it just gets stuck kind of on the rocks in front of me. It doesn't even go into the sky, really. It doesn't even flow through that center. It just gets stuck. So that's what happens when you're using very wide angle lenses. Wide, I'm sorry, wide, yeah, wide angle lens. Um, okay, moving on, next image. Now I'm at 24 millimeters. And as you can see, all of a sudden that foreground became a little less powerful, but more things came into play. Like now you have those buttes in the distance. Now your eye is kind of looking at more things. More stuff is interesting. This is a six vertical shots at 235, uh, at 24 millimeter, resulting 235 megapixels. Now we're zooming in even more. Now we're at 70 millimeters. Now like, now the clouds, this, this, the mountains, the buttes, the foreground, you've almost equalized the emphasis here on everything. And I love that because my eye like kind of ping pongs around to different areas of this image now. Um, but again, just, I, I went back to this image just to show you again, I knew where my beginning was and where my end was. My beginning was leaving a little bit of space on the left for the buttes, making sure you get the light from the sun to come in. And then on the right, I ended the image with the rocks. Like I closed it. There's an opening and there's a closing. And obviously I want your eye to go from left to right here, right? I want it to get stuck. I want you not to leave the image. Um, so I love this place, by the way, guys. If you guys are in Texas, so you're a lot closer to uh, New Mexico than me, a lot of you. Uh, White Sands National Monument. Man, I, I, I'm going to be there actually in a few weeks. I'm pretty excited. Um, it's, a park now. it's a national park now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, when I, when I took this photo, it was not. But I love this place because not too many people go there and it's magical. The, the, the sand there is, it's like the particles are so fine that it gets picked up by the lightest wind and it diffuses the sunlight or the moonlight or whatever light. And it creates such an atmosphere that I've never seen anywhere else. It's just like always dreamy. You like can't take photos that are not dreamy. Um, but the reason I pulled this up is because I didn't shoot this vertically. I shot this horizontally. So these images are shot in a, um, in a, in a landscape orientation, three of them, because I knew I didn't need anything else in that sky. And I knew I didn't want anything else below that. So sometimes you don't have to be, um, in a portrait orientation, man, oh, such a cool place. Um, by the way, that sand does not get hot. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still talking about white sands. It can be 100 degrees outside and you can lay down flat on your back in that sand and you'll cool down actually. 
Um, cityscapes, same thing. You know, you can do cityscapes in the same panoramic vertical format as I've been showing you everything else. Um, wide angle lenses work really well where I was. I shot this uh, during a party that I was supposed to be social at, but they had a really nice balcony with a really nice view and I had my tripod and my camera. So I chose uh, <laughs> to stay out there and take photos. Um, 24 millimeters in a landscape. This is what that would look like. Uh, 35 millimeters, the, 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 everything in the distance becomes a bit more powerful. I'm gonna quickly run through the rest of the images because now I'm just showing you examples. Um, uh, 50 millimeters, 50 millimeters seems to work really well for me here in New York, shooting one row from New Jersey to New York. Uh, like this is perfect for me, 50 millimeters. Uh, this is a 70 millimeter two row image of the, I think this is the Brooklyn Bridge, Manhattan Bridge on a very moody morning. 135 millimeter, man, the Smoky Mountains guys. Wow. I shot this off a place called the Foothills Park, Foothills, yeah, Foothills Parkway. If you guys ever go down there, definitely take that road. There's so many beautiful pull-offs. Um, and then you can do the same thing with drones. So this image is off my drone and the drone does it automatically. It's so easy, so much easier than what I'm doing. You just set, you just set it to panoramic mode. You click on, they have different options. They have like 360, they have 180, they have a vertical option, but this is the 180 and the 180, option the DJI offers takes 21 photos in three rows. So it takes seven up top, seven in the middle and seven in the bottom. And it gives you this back automatically at as a JPEG. And it gives you the raw images individually. So you can still put them together as a raw panel on your own with the click of one button uh, by the, what's up? Oh, go ahead and finish your thought and I'll interrupt you. Oh, just to just a little bit of, I was going to give a little backstory to this shot. This was the last photo I took before I lost a drone and I had to plan a whole recovery mission. It took me an entire week to figure out how to get the drone. And normally, um, you know, I wouldn't care, but I knew I wanted this image. I wanted my memory card. I didn't care about the drone, but nothing was going to stop me from getting this image. I knew, I remember the pink clouds melting and I'm like, no. Um, but just a word to the wise, when the drone starts to give you warnings, <laughs> return to home, not enough battery life, return to home, accept the warnings. Don't just cancel them like I did. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Okay, so let me, um, okay, so while we're talking drones, Dom is curious, what drone do you have? Um, this was shot with the 2S, the Mavic 2S, which is really a great drone for size and um, low light. The, the Mavic 2S has the same sensor as the Mavic Pro, the previous Mavic Pro did, but I did just upgrade to the Mavic 3, um, which I haven't really started using yet. Okay. So you were talking about the drone and I understand three rows, but can you clarify, there's a couple of people that are, are we just want to understand it. Um, what do you mean by two rows? What do you mean by three rows when you do panos? Not necessarily with the drone, but when you're doing them on your tripod. Can you explain okay. what one row or two row means. Yeah, totally. Um, so if your uh, camera is pointing straight and it's perfectly level, right? And um, then you were to take that photo and pan across, for example, keeping your camera pointed straight forward, right? Uh, I'm sorry, let me just, let me start that over. Uh, 
let's say that your camera is completely level, pointing forward, and you shoot that row going all the way across. Then you take your camera and you tilt it upwards 30 degrees from there. And then you take another row cutting across again. Now you've shot one row with more sky because you point it up. And then you have one that's even along the horizon. Now a third row could be you now tilting it another 30 degrees down towards the ground or the water or whatever is even more in your foreground. So that's what I, that's what the three rows are here. One of them is pointing more down at the ground. One is pointing directly straight where the horizon is perfectly level. And then the third one is getting much more sky. Sorry, I didn't clarify that earlier. That is important to know. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I only have two more photos and then I'm opening the floor to questions. Um, here's another drone shot, another pano from the drone. This is in Utah. This is very one of my favorite locations. It's um, pretty close to the border of Colorado. <laughs> um, this is in Colorado, Crested Butte area. Just something that you could never capture, you know, without a drone. But yeah, thank you guys so much for listening to me chat about overlanding the outdoors and panoramic photography. Um, hit me up anytime for any advice with travel, uh, rigs, photography, my favorite pizza topping, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. There's a couple of questions in here that are flooding. So this is great. Uh, Meek is curious, how much editing do you usually have to do after Lightroom creates the panoramic panorama? Um, yeah, so when I shoot, by the way, when I shoot panoramas, I just can't wait to get home much more than when I shoot regular images because I don't know what I have, right? right? So it's so fun, just like rushing home versus like you already know what it looks like. Anyway, so um, it depends on how complex the image is, but I try to, I try to do no more than like 30 minutes to an hour at most if I have to. Some images take me five minutes, 10 minutes. Some, some I just, I won't be happy with after I edit it for 10 hours. Like, I, I just never know. I, it, sometimes I have to keep going back to a photo until I'm happy with it. Some photos take me years. And I know that that's not what you mean, but um, some photos I'll have to keep re-editing re re over and over and taking time between until I nail it. But um, generally now I know I have like a, I know what I like. I know where I'm going with something usually. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of it. Okay. I'm going to get you to take down your screen. And I think there's one or two more questions. Oh, yeah. Um, let's see where to go. Okay, so Darlene wants you to clarify. She understands taking the rows, but how do you stitch them? So Darlene, do you use Lightroom? Mm, let's assume she does. Okay. So Lightroom, um, you just use the you if you have if you already are using Lightroom and you have a catalog in Lightroom, then you already have all your photos in there, right? You would just have them all selected and you right click on them and a menu comes down that allows you to just click on merge, photo merge, and then there's an option for panorama. That's it. All you do is select all of the images in that series. You right click on any single one of those selected images. A menu pops out. One of the items says photo merge. You highlight photo merge. And then panorama pops out from there and you click on panorama. Okay. That's it. Okay. So uh, I cheated because I, I use Lightroom. So I want to make sure that I understood. But Darling uses Photoshop. So mm -hmm. do you, can you answer the same question in Photoshop? Yeah, you do it in Adobe Camera Raw. Um, you just, when you're importing into Photoshop, you just open everything in Adobe Camera Raw and then you could do the same thing from there. You have the same options. 
You can do a HDR panel. You can do panel or HDR. Okay. Um, all right. I'll and then what, can I just say one more thing? There's another program, if you're not using those, which is dedicated to panoramic stitching. And that one is named PT GUI. Um, P-T-G-U-I. Now, Lightroom and Photoshop both cannot edit images that are higher than 536 megapixels. The raw processor of Lightroom or Photoshop can't handle that. So you have to use PT GUI when you get to that extent. But I just never want to go there because that's just, that's too much. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna slide this in here and, and you can reject them if you like. But when I ask what, if I can tag along, the answer better be yes, Lawrence. But Michael wants to know, does your Jeep want a forerunner buddy to tag along? Where, who's asking that? Michael. Hey, Michael, where are you from, man? Where is Michael? He's in Fort Worth. In Texas. Texas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm, always in the West Coast. Follow me on Instagram. I'm overlanding photography. Hit me up if you see me on the road, if you're close by. Um, yeah, totally, man. There's a place that opened up for jeeping or overlanding or exploring up in the, in the, in by Palo Duro Canyon, especially made for overlanding. It's an overland park. Um, it's called Message me on Instagram if you want to know, but I, I forget the name, but okay. yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask this because it might help Ben. He wants to know why did you take a tripod and camera to a party? Because I kind of take it everywhere I go. I have this problem. <laughs> so, okay, here, here's the deal. Uh, you guys really, if you weren't following him on Instagram, follow him for no other reason but to watch his my stories. Because if this is the same party, Lawrence, I watched this on Instagram that you're like, it was everybody's dressed to the nines. I know. And here goes Lawrence to the to the uh, balcony to shoot. So he's fun to watch. His stories are really fun and they're entertaining. And um you have a way of putting me who might be sitting in an office or somewhere less interesting. Um, you have a way of storytelling with your videos um, of putting me right there with you without having to, you know, worry about, you know, not having a shower or a toilet or whatever. So it, you're fun to watch on Instagram. So um, I, I really, I really appreciate you coming. Um, all right. Thank you. I think we can close out the session. I don't see any other questions in here. Um, you're going to love the comments that are in the chat, and I'll definitely get those to you. Lawrence, thank you for coming back and doing um, part two of, of your, your journey in overlanding. And I am particularly tickled that um, you threw in this bonus information on how to do panoramics. So I'm going to rewrite your, your, your text so that um, <laughs> we can make sure that people don't just go overlanding it. No, the, this whole section on uh, panoramics, panoramas could have been a whole session by itself. Yeah. So thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. I so appreciate you. Um, and I'm going to talk you into coming back. So I'm going to figure out something else I want um, to Make know. <laughs> you got it, Linda. I know, but yeah, I know. Not, Thank you I for this know. platform. Thank you for allowing me to share my stories and inspire people. And, and in, particularly this time to widen or broaden your horizons, if hey, you know what I mean. Literally, yeah, literally. <laughs> All right, let me, let me close that, close the session out. Um, again, thank you very, 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 very much for coming back. Um, you guys, you can connect with Lawrence through his website, overlandingphotography.com and on Instagram at overlandingphotography. Next week, David Downs will be here to share his presentation, Exploring the Artist Within. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon. <laughs>